Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today in this recorded webinar where we will be focusing on basic information regarding video nystagmography or VNG. I will try to split this lecture into 10 to 15 minutes uh, videos. Hopefully you will find them beneficial. I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Salah Rasinu and I'm currently uh, an audio vestibular clinical researcher at DEVA or Development Adaptation and Handicap Laboratory at Université de Lorraine. Uh, I also uh, am a board member or funding member of the Arab Balance Society, who I recommend you to join. If you have any question, please feel free to contact one of our members. Now, everyone's talking about coronavirus and, or COVID-19, and a lot of us are actually home because of it. Imagine I'm asking you to diagnose based only on an X-ray. Do you think this information is enough? Not only I ask you to diagnose based on an X-ray, but I also gave you a picture that is missing blocks. This is very similar to how I feel when we're diagnosing a vestibular disorder that is only relying on one test. Let me give you another example. Let's say I give you this audiogram. You're gonna see, and I'm only going to give you the, the heating level at 500 Hertz, and I'm gonna say that your patient has a 50 dB heating level. How would you fit this patient? And uh, I assume, that as an audiologist, you're going to tell me these are not enough information for me to be able to fit the patient. I don't know how he's going to have, what's going to be his audiogram configuration, what's his level at high frequency and at low frequency, middle frequency. So this is not enough information for you to be able to fit this patient. Similar situation would be uh, for us when we're actually testing the vestibular system. How can we rely on only one item, one test to um, to actually diagnose vestibular disorder. So for example, this is a very nice picture taken by an article by Courtois and Al in 2010 in Neurophysiology. A quick reminder that the vestibular system is made of three semicircular canals, the, the vestibular or the uticle and the saccule, and the vestibular, the vestibular nerve, both his superior and his, um, and his inferior part. Now to test, the lateral canal, we have plenty of tests to do. We can do video head impulse tests or head thirst, calorics, uh, rotary chair. We can also do lateral uh, positioning tests and positional. To test the vertical canals, we can do dynamical visual equity. We can do v hit We can do positional like a Dixol pike, for example. To test the utricle and saccule, the mainly we use VAMPs, uh, C-VAMPs and O-VAMPs. We can also do subjective visual vertical. We can do uh, skull vibration induced nystagmus. We have plenty of tests to, to be able to get information regarding the impact, the, the, how good these structures are functioning. But similar to an audiogram, and this is a concept that uh, Dr. Georges Duma and I are trying to uh, bring back after Ilmar published it in 2003, 2004, the concept of vestibulogram. What I'm trying to explain here is that similar to an audiogram, different tests at different frequency will provide different information about uh, the structures, the vestibular structure. So we are mainly focusing in our lecture today on the VNG that it provides information at very low frequency, the calorics at 0 0.03 and the spontaneous gaze at 0 0.01, okay? Now, other tests like the rotary chair are providing information about low and medium frequency. The V-head or video head impulse set is providing us information between three and six hertz. That's the video head impulse test. We can do dynamic visual equity and head shaking tests around two hertz approximately. The skull vibration induced nystagmus test is at a very high frequency, around 100 hertz. The uh, VAMPs can be done at 200 and 500 hertz. So back to the main idea. One test is never enough if we want to test across the frequency of um, frequency for the vestibular system. And I'm going to give you a simple example. One of the biggest um, panels that is currently happening is that uh, in many cases, you're going to have a positive caloric, yet a negative V-hit. Similar results are seen in canal dehiscence. And the question is, then are we testing different things? No, we're not. We're testing the same system, but different frequency are providing us with different information, mm -hmm. similar again to the audiogram. And here's why it's important for us to keep the idea of um, VNG. And as you know, till now, till now, the caloric is still our gold standard. 
Now, back to the idea, the, 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 the main test that we're going to be talking about, which is nystagmography. And as you know, it's difficult to obtain direct recording from the peripheral vestibular system. This is why we do eye recording by VNG or video nystagmography. The other way of doing it is electronystagmography. So what's nystagmography is actually a being able to record the nystagmus using the eye movement. The VNG relies on um, direct measurement of movement of the pupil using infrared uh, video goggles. Whereas ENG is um, uh, collecting information of the corneal retinal potential, CRP, through electrodes. Mainly we'll focus again uh, on the VNG today because it's what's been used um, majorly in clinic. I would use ENGs only in cases where I have a blind patient, for example, or sometimes children if they're not cooperative with the VNG. What can the VNG provide us? What are the information that the VNG can tell us? First of all, if there is a lesion or dysfunction, it will also provide us with information about if the problem was central or peripheral. Uh, it will provide site of lesion, what kind of dysfunction we have and if it's compensated, yes or no. And finally, what is the best way to manage what we found? For example, if we do the positioning and positioning and we found we have a possibility of DPPV, then we know aptly maneuver is the best, best, to, uh, best step to follow. The VNG environment is very important. We need, the room of the VNG should, should be, first of all, isolated from the waiting area and away from the booth because uh, the calorics can be a bit diff difficult test and people may scream. So <laughs> that's a it's funny uh, remarks, but it's important to keep it away. You don't need a very large room, but you need it to be very well uh, darkened and you need to have a proper vent ventilation with a thermostat. Because sometimes in very hot countries or in very cold countries, getting the proper temperature in the room is essential for us to be able to get the temperature of the irrigation that we're going to use, irrigator, correct for caloric testing. What else we're going to use in the room? We're going to need a patient table or a chair, and we're going to talk about that in a few seconds, a visual display. And again, I usually like to put the door next to the visual display. Do not forget the supplies, including vomiting bag, pillow in case the patient has a neck problem, and um, uh, disinfecting uh, uh, material. Now, what is the equipment that we, the basic equipment? Definitely the software is essential, but we need a projector or a TV and a light bar. Each one of them has their advantages and disadvantages. The light bar, especially that we need to center the patient, uh, permits that we can move the light bar very easily up and down. Whereas the TV projector, the TV is stable and I will have, a, here it's a small projector, but we can also have it on a large screen TV and then we'll have to have a chair that moves up and down, adjust the height of the chair, so the patient is completely centered. Now, keep in mind that the patient needs to be centered. I usually ask the patient and I do it my, I, I, I make sure myself that the patient is centered because as you know, some patients will have a problem detecting what's centered and that's the SVV uh, role later on. So keep that in mind. And we're doing, we're keeping the patient in a visual angle of 20 degree at eye level. I ask the patient always to um, make sure to stop any medication prior to coming to us, including antiviral, maxine, dramamine, uh, Valium, but for sure consult with the physician that is, for, that is bringing or sending this patient to you for testing, or if you are the, the physician, make sure that we can actually uh, stop these medications for the patient. In case we cannot stop them for two days, the minimum we can do is to stop them 24 hours prior to the appointment. But I will talk about other medications that we need to stop also 24 hours prior to the appointment. Uh, I ask usually to stop any caffeine drinks, and I re remind the patient that Red Bull, for example, or you know, energy, energy drinks and um, soft drinks contain uh, caffeine. And I also um, um, ask them to stop uh, drinking alcohol 24 hours prior to the appointment because as you know, uh, ethanol, um, if recent, and I mean by less, less than 12 hours, can cause a positional nystagmus and we call it an alcohol-induced nystagmus. So keep that in mind. So what are the medications that are necessary to stop 24 hours prior to this is anti-nausea medicine, antiferticum medicine, narcotics, and antihistamine, or any over-the-counter cold remedies. I also asked the patient, based on a study done in 1987 by Simony and Al, uh, to stop nicotine at least, uh, uh, if possible, eight to 10 hours 
prior to testing. And the reason is that it can, may cause upbeating the stagmas uh, that have been recorded in different studies. On the day of the testing, I make sure that the patient is not wearing makeup and uh, they don't have oils on their face because that makes it really hard for us to be able to record. I know a lot of patients will come to me with uh, fake lashes, a huge eyeliner. So what I usually do is all I ask her to remove the hair makeup if possible. And if it's a tattoo, I usually put a white eyeliner on top of it. Uh, fake lashes, they need to go. Now I heard that some new system on the market is uh, does not um, take that into consideration. And even if she's putting um, eyeliner, that won't be caught by the machine. And that's great. I'll hopefully be able to provide you further information regarding the system soon. I ask them always to wear comfortable clothing, to wear their contact, but bring their uh, eyeglasses with them in case they need to. Um, someone needs to drive them uh, back home. That's recommended. And finally, not to eat for hours prior to coming to us to the testing. On the day of the testing, I always start with the case history. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the case history, that's definitely a different, different webinar. And then I'm gonna do otoscopy. Otoscopy is mandatory, it's not optional. Because if you have impacted serum and you will not be able to test the patient into calorix, and it's the worst thing to do, to spend doing all the tests and then you arrive to calorix and you're not able to test because the ears are clogged. The other thing is that if you see a perforation, you cannot go with uh, a perform, um, water irrigation, you have to go with air irrigation. So that's a note that is important. I try as much as I can to always have an audiogram with me because in case I have a conductive or mixed hearing loss, I, um, I need to report it in my commentary, especially that calorics are affected by conductive hearing loss or mixed hearing loss. Anything within the last uh, uh, week or so would be enough. Now, sometimes um, if it's a well-known case, then if it's present, so I don't ask the patient to actually repeat the audiogram. And now we're gonna go to the VNG. Within the VNG, we have the calibration component. I do ocular motor testing, and within the ocular motor, we have the scat smooth pursuit, OPK, gaze test, and spontaneous nystagmus test. We have also positional and positioning, and finally, the calorics. We're gonna be stopping here for this video. The next video will talk about calibration ocular motor testing, and the, next, the third video will talk about positioning and calorics. Thank you for watching.